Recently, the chess world has been placed into turmoil after Magnus Carlsen withdrew from a game, resigned another early and placed this announcement on Twitter regarding concerns over cheating in chess. And by cheating, he means using computer assistance. Cheating is particularly bad in online play, even at the highest level, and the major websites such as chess.com claim to have sophisticated algorithms to detect cheats. So when people are cheating, what are the common methods that are used? Well, first, you can try with two devices. So this will be where you have the game running online, say on your computer, and then you've got Stockfish or something open on a tablet, and you'll be making the moves for the games on both devices. It's often clear when your opponent is doing this because they usually take at least four seconds a move, no matter how clear the next move should be. Another one is actually to have a bot play the complete game for you. This is something that's often really, really clear because the intervals between the moves are extremely regular. And both these methods will give a very, very high accuracy and therefore will be easily detected by uh, some kind of algorithm, say, on chess.com. But both these methods are not what a strong player wants. A strong player wants the engine for occasional advice. It, they want an analysis partner. And when I saw this tweet from Carlson, I wondered how easy it would be to build an analysis partner. And the answer was surprisingly easy, and it took all of about 90 minutes. On the screen here, you can see me playing uh, versus Jimmy, the computer on chess.com. I'm cheating. On the right, I have a browser open with Stockfish Infinite Analysis running and updating live with the board position that I'm actually playing on chess.com. And you'll note that I'm not having to do any updates of the moves for Stockfish or anything like that. It's running automatically. I've played with humans and resigned most of the games so that they don't lose and played against computers and not been detected at all. My own real life online chess rating on Lee Chess is about 1200, which means I'm very, very weak and I'm certainly not cheating. And I want to be really, really clear before going on. I have absolutely no interest in cheating. I can't imagine anything less fun when playing chess than using something else to play the game for you and win the game for you. It seems completely pointless. However, given recent events, I do think it's worthwhile to show you, especially if you're not a programmer and you're watching this, just how easy uh, this was to build. So here's how it was built. And before I start a disclaimer, the code was written as fast as possible with no thought to the design whatsoever, because I have actually no interest in keeping this code, making it a robust program or anything like that. So the first step was to get a 10 minute email and then register on chess.com. And then I had to think about actually how to go about doing this. And the first thing I need is the actual game position. My original intention was actually to make screen captures of the board and then break those down into pieces and analyze them using Python or something. But I realized that I wouldn't actually get the casting information or the en passant information. And what I really needed was either a move list or an FEN string. So I started a game against a computer on chess.com and inspected the DOM to see if I could find the move list. And there it was, conveniently named Vertical Move List. Closer inspection showed it had a simple structure with a diff for each move pair and the individual moves uh, with a handy ply number inside each of them. One thing I did notice was that the knight image was on the move list and that actually messed up the notation. But luckily there was an option to change that so you could go to just normal text and otherwise everything was very straightforward. The next question was actually how to get hold of this move list programmatically whilst actually playing a game. My first thought was to use Selenium, which is a library that uses web drivers to actually automate websites. So if you saw my video doing the bot on Twitter, I use Selenium because they banned me using the API. So I automate it using Selenium. But most websites and hopefully chess.com as well are built actually to detect when you are using some kind of uh, automation like Selenium. So I discarded that because I assume that will be detected very, very quickly. So I wondered about an extension. I've never written one before, so I jumped onto the Firefox documentation to take a look. And they have an example that turns a web page border red. And you just need two files, a manifest.json and a JavaScript file, in this case, borderify.js. So I opened VS Code, copied these files, changed the border from 5 pixels to 20 pixels to make it a little bit bigger, and then changed the URL, of course, to chess.com. Going to the About Debugging page, you can then load the extension and voila, there was a red border. I couldn't quite believe it, so I went back, changed the border to green just to make sure, and uh, it worked again. Our extension needs to get the vertical move list and then watch for changes to the children of this element. Luckily, JavaScript has something called a mutation observer, which is a doddle to implement. So you just get your element, create a new mutation observer, put a call back inside, and then set it to observe when the script loads. So saving the file, reloading the extension, and then making some moves on the board. We can see in the console that we've got the updated element, and inside the children we can find the text of the move, which is the thing that we'll be needing for later on. The next step is actually to process the move list and then extract the move text. 
this is written really, really badly as I had no interest in anything other than throwing this code away. But what it does is create a string with all of the moves in the move list separated by an underscore. Running the extension again, we can see the code then working in the console and we can see the move string with all the underscores separating the moves. So one of the biggest hurdles was actually solved now and that was how to get the live move list out of the DOM. Now it was time to think a little bit about the structure of how the program's actually going to work. And it's split quite easily into four parts. So there's the extension and that then sends the moves to a server, which I needed to build. And then the server will actually be running an instance of Stockfish, just the, the normal Stockfish executable. It'll send these moves to Stockfish Stockfish. Stockfish then will output its stream of analysis and usually there's a huge amount of it very, very quickly. And when this analysis comes out, the server is going to emit an event and send then this analysis immediately to our client, which is the bot web page. In other words, what we'll be needing is a server that can receive HTTP requests, which will come from the browser extension when the move list is updated, and also WebSockets so we can immediately emit events and send the analysis from Stockfish to our bot client. Turns out that Flask Socket IO with Python is basically perfect for this. And the starting point being to make an endpoint that can receive moves from the extension. So updating the code in the extension to send to the server, running the server, we can see in the console that we get a response. And sure enough, the local server is also getting the move list. Now what we need is the bot client to receive updates from the server, starting with the move list as a test. So we start with some HTML boilerplate in VS Code, add in a div with the ID moves for the moves, and then create a socket to the server and a callback when the server emits a moves event. When it does, we'll take the content and then update our div with it. We need to emit moves from the server, check it all works, make sure we add socket IO to the imports, and then go back in the browser and running our client alongside chess.com, we can see that the server is working because we're getting a live updated move list on the client. It was at this point that I realized there was a little bit of a gotcha here. The moves are in SAN or standard algebraic notation format and not algebraic format. So they're slightly different. So SAN would just be NF3 for knight F3 and algebraic would be G1 F3. To be able to send them to Stockfish, they need to be algebraic. And I was worried that I was going to have to write a huge piece of code to be able to convert the moves, which meant having a legal move uh, generator and board and stuff like that. Luckily, there's a library called Python Chess, which does all this conversion for us. So instead of feeding the moves directly to Stockfish because they're in the wrong format, we'll use Python Chess to create a board, feed it the SAN moves, and then it can give us back an FEN, which represents the, uh, the position on the board. So the next step then actually is to make this FEN on the server from the moves that we've received then from the extension. So we'll add a div and a socket event for the FEN on the client, and then we need to make ourselves on a server a class that can actually process these moves, and we'll call it, uh, I don't know, move receiver. And this class will actually control the Stockfish process as well. So therefore, it was easiest to make it as, as a thread so it can run sort of separately on its own. And then what it does is use a queue to wait for a signal that moves have arrived to the server. And when they do, then it basically takes that off the queue and then processes them. So when a move string arrives, it calls get FEN, breaks this string up, and then uses Python chess then to get the FEN string and emit this as an event back to the client. Back in the server file, we need to set up the queue, the move receiver thread, and also start the thread before the first server request. Now, all being well, what we should do is see the FEN on the client, and we do. So the final remaining step is actually to run the Stockfish process that we can send it the FEN and get the analysis back. The first thing we'll need is a couple of functions to encode and decode this output. And then I added an engine writer class. So this is a very, very simple class that runs on its own thread that will write anything to Stockfish. It uses a queue to wait for commands, which will send from the move receiver. And when it gets these, it sends them then into the standard input of Stockfish. Likewise, we'll add then a reader class. Again, runs on another thread. And this basically sits uh, blocking, waiting for output. And when it gets some output from Stockfish, it checks whether it has CP and multi-PV in it, because it probably then is an analysis string that we want to use. And if it does, then it emits this as an analysis event, which hopefully our client will see via the WebSocket. Finally, in the move receiver, but we add start engine so that when the move receiver is created, we actually start this engine process. So we've got Stockfish up and running. And then in there, we create the threads for the standard input, the standard output, and send the initial UCI uh, startup commands that you need to send so that Stockfish is ready to go. Finally, we add a go infinite function, which simply is used that when we get a new FEN is to tell Stockfish to stop its current analysis, set it up with the latest FEN, and then start some new infinite analysis. 
So we'll update the client to add the div for analysis and it should work. And back on chess.com, you can see that we are indeed getting live analysis from Stockfish. And that's it. A few lines of code is all it takes. So hopefully that's been interesting. Maybe you've learned something. Uh, I won't bore you with the details of all the CSS and things just to make it look a bit nicer. And thanks for watching.